So in this video, I'm going to talk about a geometrical interpretation of, of the determinant of a matrix. What does it mean? So we've already answered this question in two dimensions. There I said that if you take a basis i and j here, then the square formed, if this is an orthonormal basis, then the area of this square is 1. But if you apply a matrix A to these vectors, then you get two new vectors like this. So this one is A applied to I, and this one is A applied to J. And if you form the shape in the same way, which is now a parallelogram, like this, then the area of this shape is going to be equal to the determinant of A, or at least the absolute value of the determinant of A. Now this turns out to be true for any dimension, instead, as long as you replace area with volume. The determinant tells you by how much, by what factor, does the transformation A change the volume of the space. Okay, so I'm just going to show it in three dimensions because that's the highest dimension where thinking about volume is easy. So in 3D. So first of all, suppose I've got a matrix A. So I can imagine this matrix A as being made up of three vectors, which I call U and V and W. So this is UX, UY, UZ, VX, VY, VZ, WX, WY, WZ. Now if I compute the determinant of this matrix, then using the rule I showed you before, so it's this one times the determinant here, so that gives you UX times VYWC minus VZWY, and then this one. Okay, but this one has a minus from the chessboard, so this is minus UY times the determinant of this, which is VXWC minus VZWX, and then finally plus this one here, right? which is uc vx wy minus vy wx okay but you notice something hopefully these formulas look familiar this here is the x component of the vector product v cross w right and the same is true of this one it's the y component of the vector product And this one is the z component of the vector product, right? So what you do is you multiply the x component of u with the x component of the vector product, add the y component of u times the y component of the vector product, which is minus, right? So these two minuses here cancel. And then finally add the z component of u times the z component of the vector product. But that is just a scalar product of two vectors, right? So the determinant of A is equal to the vector U scalar product, the vector product of vectors V and W. Okay. And this is significant. I mean, you can use this to calculate the determinant, but this also has, as I say, a geometrical significance because, as I said in the very first video on matrices, this first column here tells you what A does to the first basis vector. So this is A of I. The second one here is what A does to the second basis vector. This one here is what A does to the third basis vector. Right? So if we try and think about what this looks like as a picture, I started out with my three basis vectors like this, okay, so this is i and j and k, okay, and if I make a cube of these vectors here, then the volume of this cube is equal to 1, right? Now, if I apply the transformation a, then the vector i is mapped into a times i, which is the vector u. Let's suppose that's somewhere down here, this is u. And the vector j is mapped into v, 
let's suppose this is here. Let's make this one a bit smaller, V. And the vector K is mapped into the vector W. So U is A of I, V is A of J, and W is A of K, like this. So now you have to consider the shape, the volume of the shape formed by these three vectors here, so that looks like this, and this, and do, do, do here, and this, and this, okay. So you end up with a shape like this, this is called a parallelopiped, right? It's like a cube, but the angles here don't have to be 90 degrees. So we have to work out what the volume of this thing is, and the volume of this thing is equal to the area here. So if I call this area A, times the perpendicular height from here. So if I extend this here and make this a right angle, this is quite hard to draw, right? If this is a right angle here, and this height is h here, then the volume of this shape is equal to the area a times the height h, where h is the perpendicular height, but we know that the volume of a, this is just the same as the two-dimensional case, and there we show that the volume, sorry, the area of a is equal to the size of V cross W. Okay. And H, H is the length of U times the cosine of the angle theta, where theta is this angle here. Okay. But this line here, the line of which length is h, is perpendicular to v and w. Right? This angle is 90 degrees. Therefore, it is parallel to v cross w. So the angle theta is the angle between u and v cross w. Okay? But then, therefore, this defines the formula for the scalar product. Right? So this is v cross w dot u. Okay. But we've already shown that this is equal to the determinant. Okay. So that's the answer. Okay. So this shows that in three dimensions also the magnitude of the determinant tells you this change in volume factor of the transformation A. And you can show that this is true in any dimension. Now this also gives you an easy geometrical way to understand why if the determinant of A is zero then that means that there's no inverse right? because determinant of A is zero in this geometrical picture must mean that the volume of this shape is zero well how can the volume of this shape be zero? the volume of this shape can be zero if and only if the vector W lies in the same plane as the vectors u and v. Okay? So then the shape is squashed, right? So it has zero volume. And this is the only way you can get zero volume. So determinant a equals zero means that u, v, and w all lie in the same plane. But then it's obvious that there can't be an inverse, right? Because I can take a point not in this plane. This is zero here. I can take a point a not in this plane, and it must be impossible to satisfy the equation a times some vector x equals a. Right? This has no solution. Because anything in a is a combination of u, v, and w, and these all lie in the plane which does not contain a. So therefore this has no solution. But if the inverse existed, then you could write this a minus 1 a x equals a minus 1 a x is a minus 1a. Right? So in other words, if the inverse existed, then there would be a solution. 
but we've shown that there can't be a solution, so therefore the inverse does not exist. So that's a quite sim geometrically simple way of understanding why determinant equals zero implies no inverse.